Father in heaven, as we open up your word, we ask that you send your spirit in a mighty way to guide us and lead us into all truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Mark 1, 14 and 15 reads as follows. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. The kingdom of God is here. According to Mark 1, 15, which we just read, when Jesus came on the scene and John the Baptist had phased out, we see something different happening. The reason is that this concept of the kingdom of God is one that resonated in the heart of every Jew and every early church believer. The kingdom of God is, is a very simple concept to understand. It simply means that, that God himself is going to take control of the world. God himself is going to take control of every situation and every circumstance that's happening on the world as we see it. The kingdom of God represented a new time and a new circumstance in the life of these individuals. Now the problem with their understanding, the problem with the understanding of the Jews is we need to remember that they were under oppression from the Roman Empire. And we see that most of their trials and most of their tribulations, most of their issues were physical in nature. So they were looking for a physical kingdom of power to come and crush any obstacle that came in the way of peace and prosperity for the Jewish nation. Now the idea of spiritual peace and prosperity, an inner peace and prosperity, was secondary to them. They didn't wish for this. What they wanted was a, a physical peace to come and a physical type of prosperity to reign in the kingdom of Israel. But Jesus came on the scene in Mark chapter 1 to show the true meaning of what the kingdom of God is. His life, his ministry, his example, his teachings were about to blow these misconceptions out of the water. Now part of the understanding of the nearness of the kingdom of God was to understand the nature of the kingdom of God. This kingdom was not about power coming and crushing. It was about your spirit being crushed. It was about repentance and it was about belief. A call to repentance simply means to turn around and go a different direction than what you were going before. You know, I was tickled when I, I read uh, this satirical take on an old prayer from a Christian lexicon, and it talks about repentance and sometimes how we view repentance. This is what it reads. Benevolent and easygoing Father, we have occasionally been guilty of errors of judgment. We have lived under the deprivations of heredity and the disadvantages of environment. We have sometimes failed to act in accordance with common sense. We have done the best we could in the circumstances and have been careful not to ignore the common standards of decency. And we are glad to think that we are fairly normal. Do thou, O Lord, deal lightly with our infrequent lapses. Be thy own sweet self with those who admit that they are not perfect. According to the unlimited tolerances which we have a right to expect from thee, and, and grant us as indulgent parent that we may hereafter continue to live a harmless and happy life and keep our self-respect. Amen. Now it sounds like a good plan. Father, forgive me. I'm only human. I, I make mistakes. That's what happens. But repentance says something very different. Repentance says, oh God, equip me, oh God, empower me, and by the power of your spirit, turn me away from these sins that are both serious and deadly, and allow me to, to be in your care and to believe the good news which can only be found in the life, teaching, and ministry of Jesus Christ. 
In Mark 1, 15, when it talks about the kingdom of God being at hand, this is what we're referring to. A kingdom that allows us to believe and allows us to repent. We need to turn away from what we were doing and go forward into a new direction. Now there's another step that happens, and this happens in Mark 1, 16 through 20. In Mark 1, 16 through 20, we see Jesus Christ calling his first disciples, and we see something very interesting happening here. Because after repentance and belief, the next step can be summed up in one word, discipleship. The title of my sermon, the title of this talk right now is, is He Saw. And we're going to see what it is that he saw here in Mark 1, verses 16 through 20. It says as follows, Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed. Verse 19 continues, and going a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat mending their nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. Friends, before we look at what he saw, because Jesus saw something very significant in these fishermen, I want to tell you what we see or what what I see what I see here are two sets of brothers Peter and Andrew were just two brothers trying to trying to scratch and scrape and and make it as fishermen in a very competitive society they were crass they were foul-mouthed they were smelly they were dirty they they were trying to to make their way in this very very tough industry I see a man Peter he's a fast talker He's a talker who, who always speaks what's on his mind. He's, he's always ready to, to, to fight or to combat if, if someone goes against him. And we, we see Andrew, his brother, right alongside him, following along with him and, and doing these things. That's what people see, or saw, I should say, when they were going by and watching these fishermen. Now in James and John, we see two rich boys. They were fishing from a boat. They were working with their father. They, they had a business that they were going to inherit. Zebedee had his hired hands and he had a boat. They had a future. They had something to look forward to. And I, I see two brothers taking this same desire for fame in their ministry and Jesus doing something different with them. Now that's what I see. I, I, I see two fishermen and I see two uh, sets of brothers in a boat casting a net, catching fish. But what did Jesus see? Because the Bible says that he saw. Yes, he saw them. He saw them fishing, but he saw something different. He saw four men who had great potential to be molded and shaped into mighty preachers of the gospel. He saw foul-mouthed Peter changed into a pillar of leadership under the new reign of God. He saw John, also a, a crass fisherman, becoming one of the most loving and caring people in the early church. He saw James, who was known, along with John, for his anger. They were called the sons of thunder. He, he saw him become one of his first followers who surrendered his life for the cause of the gospel. Listen to how Ellen G. White puts it in her book, Education. This is what she talks about, how, what Jesus saw. She says the following, In every human being, he discerned infinite possibilities. I'm going to say that again. He discerned infinite possibilities. He saw men as they might be, transfigured by his grace in the beauty of our Lord and God. Looking upon them with hope, he inspired hope. Meeting them with confidence, he inspired trust. Revealing in himself man's true ideal, he awakened for its attainment both desire and faith. He awakened both desire and faith. Friends, in these two words he saw, we see a very wonderful and hidden lesson. Jesus saw what other people saw, but he saw beyond that. 
While he was passing those disciples, he, people saw uneducated and low-class fishermen. Yes, Jesus saw that also, but Jesus also saw men washed by his transforming grace into powerful and skillful participants in the kingdom of heaven. When Jesus looks at us, he doesn't see what the world sees. When Jesus looks at us, he doesn't see what our friend sees. When Jesus looks at us, he doesn't see what our parents see, what our children see, or what anyone else sees. Even though others may, may look at you and see potential, because others may look at you and see, oh, you're, you're onto something good there. They see potential in you. Jesus sees what you're destined to be. He sees a reality, not a potentiality. He sees the result of repenting and believing. He sees the power of the Holy Spirit working in your life. He sees the infinite possibilities of what you can be as you take time and surrender to him. Friends, he sees the infinite possibilities of your talents, of your abilities, of your desires as you enter into his kingdom and allow him to rule over your life. Friends, Jesus saw these things and it led him to utter these words, follow me. Follow me is what Jesus desired for his disciples and what he desires for us. But we can't look at these words in a vacuum because what Jesus saw were men who had been touched by the ministry of his cousin, John the Baptist. You see, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, they were also in the process of knowing and growing as they had heard John the Baptist's message of a kingdom that was to come. And now they were going to be in the process of maturing as they came under the tutelage of Jesus Christ himself. His job was to help them develop and strengthen that relationship in God that, that John the Baptist had planted a seed for. It was the next step in the process of entering the kingdom of heaven. Yes, he called them to follow, but he also called them to serve. He was going to make them something else besides the fishermen that they were. Instead of catching fish, they would catch men. There was a cost to this command, though. He said, I will make you fishers of men. You will become fishers of men. But in order to catch these men, they had to leave their fishing business. Friends, in order to do something new and significant, they had to leave the old and familiar. This is the call of every disciple. This is the call of every follower of Jesus Christ. We are called to, to catch men and women, but, but you may say, I, I'm not a preacher. I'm, I'm not a teacher. I, I can't do what, what they were called to do. But friends, this is the good news. This is, this is what's awesome about the God we serve. You see, when we heed the call to follow Jesus Christ, he uses our natural and acquired talents for his purposes. Whatever it is that we are good at, whatever it is that we have an inclination for, God uses that for his kingdom and his glory. Nothing that we have learned or done will be discarded. Every disciple has something in them that God can use to build his kingdom. The story is told of an accomplished violinist who was playing in his final concert. As the word went out that this would be the final time that he would be playing, another important fact was added to his concert agenda. You see, he would be playing on a violin worth $2.5 million. Many bought tickets in great anticipation. Not only did they want to hear this maestro play, but they wanted to experience the melodious sound that would come from this very expensive instrument. The violinist went on stage one final time and he delivered a masterful performance as he had always done, one for the ages. People saw this and, and they were enthralled. This was something beyond what they had seen actually. His performance brought tears to the eyes of the audience and they felt honored and privileged to, to have been at such a unique event. He received a standing ovation. The people wanted more, so he complied. What he did is he promptly threw the priceless instrument to the ground and he stomped on it. The applause came to an abrupt end. The people were aghast. 
that he was crushing this expensive instrument into pieces. Then the violinist walked off the stage. Silence filled the hall. Had he destroyed a one-of-a-kind instrument? Surely he could have passed it down to another budding musician. He could have put it in a museum. Something could have been done to this instrument. Immediately the stage manager came out and told them what had really happened. The violinist did not use an antique instrument. Instead, he played using a $75 knockoff. Now he would play using the $2.5 million violin, and play he did. He played that violin with the same grace and flawless sound as he played the cheap knockoff. Now, perhaps to the trained and focused ear, one was able to tell the difference. But during that performance, that final performance, people could not tell the difference. Most people could not tell the difference between the $2.5 million violin and the $75 violin. Friends, the violinist wanted to show in the final performance of his career that it was the violinist, not the violin, that makes the music. Friends, we are that violin, and when Jesus sees us, he can make beautiful music. He could do wonderful things for his kingdom. It doesn't matter what you're worth. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you've been. When you're in the hands of the master violinist, Beautiful things will happen for his honor and glory. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we desire to be used by you. We desire for your presence, your spirit to come and dwell within us. We know, Lord, that, that we can only be used as we surrender to you. So at this moment, at this time, may every heart be surrendered to be used by you. May we acknowledge the fact that you see us as invaluable and you see us as useful in your kingdom. And may we work to expand that kingdom and hasten the day of your soon coming. For we pray in the name of Jesus, the soon coming King. Amen and amen.